Okay, so uh, I want to start a little bit with my journey, which is, has been for a large part uh, in my professional life a journey between object-oriented and functional programming. I think my first submission to Uppsala was actually in 91. Uh, the paper explained somewhat clumsily how to express subtyping with type parameters and coercions. Um, and it got summarily rejected. Um, I still remember the text of a review I got. That was the full review. It's not clear what we can learn from this for object-oriented <laughs> programming. Uh, that didn't deter me. Uh, seven years later, I tried again, this time at ECOOP, ECOOP 98. And that paper actually got in, I mean, with co-authors like Kim Bruce and Phil Wattler. No, it's no wonder. Uh, that paper was about uh, essentially uh, an argument that languages should have both virtual types, which we nowadays call type members, and type parameters. So it argued that you need both, that there are good, good situations where you need one and, uh, where, and other situations where you need the other. And what I'll argue here is actually that type members are a great basis for both, both type parameters and members and also for modules and that type members have an elegant type theoretic foundations. So in a sense, I've come full circle. At first, I tried to explain what essentially uh, is, um, um, subtyping is with parametric polymorphism. And now I explain what parametric polymorphism is through the means of subtyping and type members. Um, so what generally what my recent work in Scala tries to achieve is make rich types usable to help programming on a broad scale. So for that, we need expressive types because they're great for modeling. We need also flexible types that don't get into people's way. So if you want to essentially appeal to lots of programmers out there, if the type system is too complicated or too rigid, then uh, it will be difficult for them to get into that. And it needs to be friendly and non-frightening to make programmers engage with the ideas. So Scala pushes the envelope in making these advanced types available for a mass audience. Uh, we don't, uh, unfortunately, we don't have audio, so I can't show you the video clip. That's a video clip from Silicon Valley, uh, where uh, that's a HBO series where Scala has quite a, quite a few uh, references. Uh, instead of uh, a TV program, which is, of course, the ultimate confirmation that you've made it, all I can show you uh, is uh, job statistics. So here's the job statistics for uh, Scala versus Java. Uh, you might say that's laughable, but actually, I would say it's actually quite amazing that we are above zero. So there is actually, there is actually a small uh, non-zero increment, and that translates to, if you look at the figures here, about one Scala job for every 15 Java jobs. Uh, here's another uh, job graph which shows uh, the the in a bit more detail. So <coughs> the uh, orange curve is Scala, and the blue curve is data scientist, which is sort of the first thing that comes up when you look at indeed.com job, job trends. And it shows a nice upward trends, and it shows that Scala has about the same upward trends, which maybe tells you something about where the jobs in Scala land are. Indeed, a lot of them are in data science, data analytics, and uh, things like that. Uh, another data point is that our MOOCs on Coursera so far got over 600,000 subscriptions. So that's mass audience, uh, all right. Uh, but the question here is, well, all this is very nice, but where are the foundations? Well, you could answer, well, why do foundations even matter? Uh, and I think that, in fact, they do matter because they help ensure properties such as type soundness they serve as a feedback loop for the language design, and they help hidden connections between language features. <coughs> so the feedback loop, I maybe want to explain with an example. So covariance, the issue of covariance has been with us also for a long, long time. Uh, one a very well-known case of covariance is covariance arrays in uh, Java, and which are, of course, known to be unsound. But do people care? Well, not really, right? So for instance, C Sharp knew perfectly well about the unsoundness issues, but it nevertheless did copy the design wholesale from Java. So, and that wasn't just because uh, people didn't know where they were going. They, know f they knew full well where they're going. And there are other languages, also respectable languages, such as Eiffel, Dart, and TypeScript, that elevate this idea that everything should be covariant to a general principle of language design. 
uh, cited advantages of that is simplicity. It's simpler and it's more intuitive. If programmers uh, uh, use, uh, they, they essentially, if you have a naive programmer, they usually think everything should be covariant. So why not make everything covariant? Why is this a problem? Well, actually, you could say it's a problem you, because you get soundness bugs. You can, you can get things where you get uh, a type error at runtime. And then probably a programmer would say, yeah, but that's, that's a checked exception in Java and C Sharp, right? How is it different from, let's say, a null pointer exception or anything, any other thing? That's just sort of in my general space of exceptions that I expect at runtime. So why should I single out one type errors to be sort of the terribly wrong exception that I can't have? OK. But I think there's actually another argument that uh, is, is a stronger one for correct foundations and for soundness. And that means that it soundness or uh, correct foundations are not so much important because they prevent us from doing the wrong thing, uh, sorry, no, but because they enable us to do the right thing. Or otherwise, if the foundations are not wrong, uh, are not right, then sometimes they prevent us from doing the right thing. So for instance, if I have a language with general covariance, and one thing I cannot do is use functions contravariantly, which of course the foundations say I should be able to do, right? A function with a larger input domain is a subtype uh, of a function with a smaller input domain. So in a sense, having the wrong foundations, uh, it might be sometimes more intuitive, but it actually prevents us from learning. Once essentially the system, uh, the, the, the theoretical foundations tell us something that's wrong, how can we ever get back to the, to the, to the path of rightness? So then the second question is, why not pick existing foundations? Uh, there are quite a few around. There's uh, FJ for featherweight Java. There's uh, Lambda Calculus. There's Logic. There's a lot of existing foundations out there. And I think the, for Scala, none of them was a very good fit because it turns out that with existing foundations, what you get usually is variants of existing languages. And Scala is not exactly a variant of an existing language. It's pretty much its own thing. And it turned out that the existing foundations simply were had too large an impedance mismatch to be able to guide us competently in the language design. So if there's two, if essentially you can encode everything in a Turing machine, but what does that tell you about your language? How does it guide you in the language design? So our aim then was uh, that we were looking for a minimal theory that can model uh, important traits that we have in Scala and in a lot of languages, type parameterization, modules, objects, and classes. And with minimal, I meant uh, that we do not deal with inheritance right now here. We can do that through extensions. There were several attempts before, uh, including one also that I, I uh, uh, contributed to that was called New Object, and that appeared at ECUB 2003. And I still remember I was quite proud of this at the time. And I went up to Martin Abadi uh, and said, well, how, do you, how did you like it? Uh, and he said, well, I'm not sure this is the definite answer to it yet. It doesn't seem to be completely canonical. And I went back and, yeah, he's probably right. Uh, so we, we need to find something that is, that is simpler. And uh, that has been sort of my quest for a long, long time since. Uh, also related to this, I should say, is 1ML, which can model type parameterizations and modules by mapping to system F. But again, the impedance match to what we want to achieve in Scala is much, much bigger than what we're after. So the basis of our model is our dependent types. Uh, so we will model modules as objects. And because uh, modules can have type members, so can uh, objects can have type members. And that means we need a notion of a dependent type. Because the type referred to, by, to a type member depends on the owning value. So we have object dot type. So the type yeah. refers to the object. In, pa in Scala, we restrict these dependencies to paths and in the calculus that I will present you here, we restrict it further to variables. <coughs> so a variable is just an x, and a path is just an, a variable um, possibly followed by selections. Before I go into the theory, I want to just show you a little, uh, some code snippets that explain what these path-dependent types are a little bit better. So uh, this is just essentially an arbitrary example uh, just to get, get the concepts across. 
So the example is heterogeneous maps. So it's essentially maps where given a key, I know what the type of the value that corresponds to the key is. And the map can have many keys with many different values and many different value types. So uh, I model that like this. I say the, type, the trait key has uh, a um, type member called value. And uh, then I have a trait age map, a uh, heterogeneous map, which has a get method here. So it takes a key and gives you optionally back a key dot value. So that's a path dependent type. The value <laughs> depends on the key. And an add method, which takes a key and a key dot value and gives you back an age map. So here's some code that uses age maps. So we have a sort method, uh, uh, sorry, a sort key and a width key. So the sort key says, well, it needs a value, which is a string. And the width key says its value, it's an int. So presumably, these are essentially command line arguments that take, take another, uh, another argument, which depends on the name of the argument here. So then we can set up a command line by saying, well, it's hmap.empty add a width of, let's say, 120, and add a sort option uh, which uh, gets parameterized with time. And if you would uh, add a third entry, like add width at a Boolean, then that would give us a type error. OK, um, so that's sort of the principle of these path-dependent types. Now, how can they encode parameters, type parameters, because that's the more common thing, and that's the other thing we're after. So here's a simple example of just essentially minimalistic lists in Scala using type parameters. So you would have a base trait list parameterized by type parameter t. Three uh, methods is empty, head, and tail. And then there would be two uh, constructors, one that constructs empty lists called nil, and one constructs uh, a cons pair. And uh, the empty list just essentially sets is empty to true, or defines is empty to be true, and head and tail to be undefined. And the cons constructor is the, what, what you see here. So straightforward, simple parametric model. Now, if you want to encode that using type members, uh, we can do that. And that's what it would look like. So instead of the type parameter, we now have a type member, type T, inside of the list. Is empty as before. Head, that's, that is just a T, but I could also have written self.t, because as usual in object oriented languages, self is implicit here. And tail is then a type list where the type T is the same as self.t. So that's what I would need to encode it, the, 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 the list trait. And then the constructors are uh, uh, pretty much as they were before, only that except defining the type parameter t here, I define it as a member field. So nil says t equals x here, and cons the same thing. OK, so you th we can say, well, we have uh, parameterized lists, non-variant parameterized lists. But in actual fact, in Scala lists are covariant. Uh, and that's expressed with this plus t here. So can we extend the system to co encodings of covariant lists? And in fact, we can. And, uh, uh, there, there are not many differences here. So I've just shown you the differences that, that we need to do to, in, to make lists covariant. So the type T is still doesn't have an annotation, because in, in our type members, we don't really distinguish variants. That's a property of parameters, not of type members. But when I write tail, where previously I, we, we said the tail of a list has the same type as the list itself, now I say because lists are covariant, any list of a given type can also be a list of a subtype of this thing. So, so that means that all I know about the tail is that the, ta the tail is a subtype of self.tail. Once I have covariant lists, then uh, I can have a bottom type, which is called nothing in Scala. And that's useful because then nil can be just a single object, not, not, a, not, a, uh, not a def, not a function. I can just uh, fix the type to be nothing. And uh, in the const type, I have the same situation for tail in the parameter here. OK, so now we have seen how to essentially what these dependent types are, how I can encode parameters in it. So it's time to do some theory. So we want to model what we've seen in a calculus which is intuitive and, and is small. And to get towards, towards a model, uh, we need some way to write functions. And uh, because we are dependent types, these functions should be uh, have also dependent function types. So uh, we use the usual uh, 
constructs from lambda calculus, so there will be a lambda. And its type will have a sort of product type, which I cho chose to have written with a for all here. So it's a for all x of type t u. Uh, and then we need some way to, to write objects. And uh, the way we do that, you see down here. So when we write an object, we call that new. So the new letter here creates a new object. And uh, the uh, construct has three parts. Uh, it has a type. That's a record that describes essentially the interface implemented by the object. It has a name for this that was the self, but the self is freely choosable. So uh, we just use an x here. And finally, it has a set of definitions which are making up the implementation that corresponds to the interface. And the type, then, of uh, such an object is essentially a record type. So it consists of the T. But because objects can refer to self in their implementation as well as in their interface in their type, so you can refer to other types in an object, uh, the whole thing has to be, again, indexed by T. So it's essentially a recursive type here. but all quantifiers and the whole thing range over term variables x. And that's a deviation from what you've seen in a lot of other type systems where type variables are essentially small t's that range over types. Here, everything ranges over terms. And that's, a, that's an important distinction. OK, so what I can model with this are things like HMAP and lists, but the, the uh, ambition is I should also model things like the whole collection package. So recursion actually is essential, though, because in the whole collection package, I will have a bunch of types, and they all mutually refer to each other. So that model is intended to actually be able to simulate both. OK, so what now is an object if you look inside, inside these definitions? So we have the self-reference x of type t and the definitions. So definitions are essentially just two kinds of things. There are method definitions, which we write uh, a equals t. So that's uh, a label, A, and it has a, has a term. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see the type view, so what the type of the definition would be. And there are type definitions, where I write the types with capital label, and again, equals type. And its kind, so to say, it's that the type of a type definition is essentially an upper and a lower bound. And finally, <coughs> I can aggregate definitions through intersection. So that's all I need in the objects. If we do the uh, connection to Scala, then uh, all these things correspond to well-known uh, Scala things. Uh, namely, the definitions here uh, are just parameterized method definitions, def a equals t. Or on the right-hand side, that's the declaration form of them. Uh, the type definitions are just type aliases. Sorry, that should be a capital T. Type a equals capital T. Uh, the declaration forms are abstract types that can have lower bounds, T1s, and upper bounds, T2. And uh, the uh, aggregation is just essentially expressed thr through a sequence, uh, whereas in the type, it's currently expressed through the width type, T1 with T2. Uh, actually, uh, the width type and intersections, they're not exactly the same thing, because the width type is not commutative, but intersections are commutative. And that's one shortcoming that we're gonna, going to fix. So Dotty, about which I will uh, uh, tell you something about in, the, in the second half of the talk, will have a true intersection operator and uh, between two types instead of the list. OK, so that, that's essentially the whole machinery that we have. Uh, to see an example, uh, let's again look at list, how li list would be encoded in this calculus. So we would say, well, it's a recursive type. Uh, we call self uh, the reference to the list. Uh, it has a type field, and its lower bound is bottom, its upper bound is top. And it has three method uh, fields, uh, is empty of type boolean, head of type self, self dot t, and uh, sorry, that should be tail of type, uh, the type that you see here. And furthermore, the list is not exactly this recursive type, because that would essentially open it and let us forge lists. Uh, we want lists to be nominal. That means lists should only be able to be constructed with nil and cons. So what you see here is just a type that's upper bounded by, by uh, this, this record, where we say, well, it's an unknown type. But we know that 
it will have these members, the members that you give here. So that's how nominality can be expressed. Okay, so you've seen that types are related by subtyping. And subtyping is essentially essential because it gives us a way to relate a path-dependent type x.a to its alias or bounds. So let's make this more concrete, and I will try to explain you the full calculus now. The syntax we've already seen. Uh, so we have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, language of the types uh, that we see here. So we have these declarations, the recursive type, the dependent function, uh, type selection, intersection, top and bottom, all these types we've seen already. In the terms, we have the object and the lambdas. We've seen those. And otherwise, we just need variables, uh, uh, selection, application, and let's. And then the definitions, again, you've seen. So this slide just uh, collects everything that we've done so far. Uh, one, one note for, for this variant here is that it's in ANF uh, form, uh, administrative normal form, uh, which means that all the operations that actually do some work operate on variables only. So I have x dot a and x applied to y rather than I have this form for arbitrary terms. That's a technical detail that simplifies some things, uh, but it's not essential. There are variants of the calculus that don't use ANF. OK, so let's look at the types. Type assign. So those are the rules for type assignments of terms. So what types terms have, and I'll just uh, present them bit by bit. So the first ones are just the two standard rules for functions, dependent functions. So the lambdas have for all types, and if uh, you have uh, a function with uh, one of these for all types and an argument, then uh, you can uh, uh, just uh, instantiate the return type of the function. So that's just dependent functions. Uh, second two rules are the rules for object creation and object selection. So the creation rule just says, well, if uh, Assuming that the type self has type T, the, the interface type, you can prove that the definitions have the same type T, then the object is well formed. So you can create one and, will, and it will have the type T. R rule for let is completely standard. Then we have uh, on the right hand side some uh, uh, substructural rules. So they essentially say you can essentially freely add and remove recursive wrappers. And uh, intersection uh, gets, uh, you can distribute intersections into the, so essentially if you can prove T and you can prove U, then you can prove that X has type T and U. And finally, there's a rule for subsumption uh, because we have subtyping here. So I wanted to just impress on you that these rules are pretty boring. I mean, you can't really make them more boring. Uh, there's, uh, there's nothing much going on. There's no subscripts, superscripts, dot, dot, dot. Everything is spelled out, and everything is what it should be. That's good. That's what we were after. OK. Uh, the next thing we need to do is, uh, again, quite simple and administrative. We have to give the, to these definitions types. And again, it's as straightforward as it could be. If you write A equals T, then you get a field of type T, of the type of the term here. And if you write uh, a type A equals uh, type, then you get a type field that has an, a lower bound of this type and an upper bound of the same type. And finally, if you take two definitions, then you can join them with an AND, and uh, the types get joined again with an AND. OK, almost done. So the last thing we need to do is subtyping. Subtyping uh, has quite a few rules, but they're all extremely boring. So this is just uh, reflexivity, transitivity, and the natural rules you need when you have intersections. Uh, the only two rules that do actually interesting works are those here. Uh, you see in the upper right where you say, well, if a variable x has a type field with lower bound s and upper bound t, then x dot a is a subtype of the upper bound and a supertype of the lower bound. So that looks also completely innocuous, but we will see that it, uh, it's that rule that makes quite a lot of problems in the meta theory later. The remaining three rules are just the usual structural rules on subtyping, where you say I push subtypes into essentially member, member types, uh, uh, term members, type members, and uh, function types. Okay, 
so the the so I should also say the one thing that's missing here is to say well we had these recursive types and there's no subtyping rule for them. That's uh, uh, nothing left out in this version of the calculus. There's indeed no subtyping rule for recursive type, which means that uh, subtyping on these things essentially is nominal only. So you'll see later in the conference, uh, actually this afternoon, a talk by Nada and Tia Rumpf uh, that shows you how to extend the theory with these structural recursive types. So that's not a fundamental limitation, but it requires uh, more machinery and the proofs get harder to actually prove the full thing with recursive subtyping. Okay, expressiveness. So simple as the model is, it's actually quite expressive. So what we can do directly, and that what I've sort of showed you uh, informally at the beginning, we can do type parameters with variance. <coughs> we can do nominal typing. Uh, we can do modules, at least generative modules. We have self-types, which you've seen. And we can do ADTs and simple classes. So that was the list example that I've shown you. Uh, classes with inheritance, I've not shown you. And in indeed, to do that well, it requires a smallish extension. OK, so that was the theory. What about the meta theory? So this should be simple to prove, right? Uh, there wasn't much to it. And that's actually it, its quality. Actually, it was all but. So, uh, we tried to prove something like this, not exactly the same thing, but something like this, since about 2008. Uh, uh, there were uh, previous publications, notably in Fool, uh, 2012, in Uppsala, uh, 14, that report about some of the advantages, but uh, lots of difficulties. Uh, so the essential challenge here, uh, so we were sort of banging our heads against the wall and says, why is this thing not provable? And uh, I think it's only over time that uh, we realized what uh, the, the problem he was here and that the problem actually is something that is rather new. So the problem here is that in that uh, calculus, in that mini language, the subtyping theory is programmer definable. So what do I mean by that? So in Scala and dot, you give the subtype relation. Uh, part of the subtype relation is given by user-definable definitions. So uh, in Scala, you could write T is a supertype of S and a subtype of U. And in the calculus, you write it uh, with the double dots here. So T is uh, between S and U. So that makes T a supertype of S and a subtype of U, of course. Then by transitivity, S is a subtype of U. Right? Because subtyping is transitive, and there's a T between them, uh, it follows from the roots. So that type definition, curiously, it proves a subtype relationship, which was potentially not provable before. So by virtue of this type T between S and U, I've now stated that S is a subtype of U, which I didn't know before. So that's essentially the, 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 the kind of curious thing that, that happens here. Now you could ask, of course, well, what if the bounds are nonsensical? So what if somebody wrote T is a supertype of any, our top type, and it's a subtype of nothing, our bottom type? So by the same argument as before, the lower bound is a subtype of the upper bound by virtue of this declaration, and we get any is a subtype of nothing. And once you have that, again, by transitivity, of, you, of course, you get every type is a subtype of every other type. That means the subtyping relationship collapses to a single point. And that's bad. You can imagine that's bad. Uh, it's, it's bad for, 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 a, for a simple reason. Uh, so if you want to prove soundness of these things, uh, let's say the, with the usual small step soundness proofs, then one thing you need to do, well, whether small step or big step, really, you need to do that always is inversion. You need to say, well, if I have a definition, let's say x equals I create some new object, then uh, I, w I, I know uh, something that, uh, 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 sorry, if, if, a, if a variable has a certain type, then I know something about how it, how it is defined. So if a variable is, let's say, a, uh, an object type, then it must be an object that I have created somehow. So that's the, the critical thing of, of inversion. But if every type is a subtype of every other type, then by subsumption, it could be anything. It could have started life as a function, and then through subtyping, suddenly it gets an object type. And then, uh, But the problem then is I know nothing by having the type of uh, a term or a variable. I know nothing about it, what, what its value is. <coughs> 
and uh, that's bad. That means I, I, I cannot have any, any argument on preservation, for instance. Okay, so you could say, yeah, sure, but these bad bounds, they are, they are they're bad, right? So we should be able to prevent them statically. And the problem is, unfortunately, we can't do that. Uh, so here uh, is uh, one example uh, where we have two types, S and T. And uh, the, in the S, both, both of these types have fields for types A and B. And in the first type, A is unbounded, and B is greater than A, but less than nothing. And in the second, so these bounds are individually good, right? So there is a type, uh, well, it, there is a type instantiation. I just set A to nothing and B to nothing, and then both of these constraints are satisfied. So no bad bounds here. No bad bounds there either, where I say A is a supertype of any and a subtype of B, and B is unbounded. I can instantiate just anything to any. But if I take the intersection of those two types, then uh, what I get is precisely twi bad bounds twice. So I get a type A that is bigger than any and smaller than nothing, and a type B that has the same constraint. So bad bounds can arise from intersecting types with good bounds, which individually have good bounds. And it turns out by a lot of counterexamples, mostly due to NADA, uh, that uh, even checking all intersections of a program statically would not exclude bad bounds. So there is no way to exclude bad bounds, and therefore collapsing subtyping theories. So how do you deal with that? Well, there's a crucial observation. To prove preservation, we need to reason at the top level not about all possible environments, but only about environments that arise from actual computation. So th those are things that I set, and therefore th those environments, that's the ones that come up at runtime. OK, and those environments, they correspond to stores which bind variables to values, so to concrete values, lambdas and mu's. And in the values, I know much more about the types, because in the values, the only way I can define a type is like this. I can say A equals T. And if I write A equals T, then of course it has good bounds. The bounds are T and T. They can't be inconsistent. So values I create at runtime always have good bounds. I know that. It's just those, those v types that I have at compile time where uh, through intersections bad bounds can arise. And now the tricky part of th this is to, to, to make an elaborate argument that indeed this runtime observation can uh, uh, show soundness in the proof, so essentially to make use of this observation at runtime. And that, that took quite a long time to, to get right. Okay, good. So we, 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 we got it. Uh, so the, the, there are soundness proofs for this sort of thing now. But what does it mean for language design? Uh, so that's, after all, what foundations are, uh, are for. Uh, that's the important part. So, so far in Scalaland, some of the soundness issues were known. But it was not clear how to fix them. So in, indeed, what people tried, and what I tried, and others tried, is to sort of exclude bad bounds statically. And it was more by the counterexamples, uh, well, by the counterexamples, and then by the proof that we finally came up with, to, that we realized that's futile. So you can't, that will never it, it succeed. What you need to do is precisely something different. You need to show also in the language that if you have a type selection p dot a, then the prefix must be a computed value. That's the one principle that carried the proof, and we can apply the same principle to the language design. So what does that mean? So let's just assume we have this bad bounds trait. Uh, and yeah, sure, I mean, th th this one, uh, everybody can see that it's wrong. But I just argued that these things can arise to, to clever intersection of other things. So there's no way to exclude them statically. So, so there are certain things where uh, problems arise when we use that trait. Uh, the first one is in a lazy vowel, because we could have a lazy value uh, whose right-hand side maybe is the triple question mark, so we'll raise an exception when called. Uh, but it might never be instantiated in the whole program run, but that doesn't prevent me from using the type x as a prefix of a type member. So here I have an example of a value that is not created at runtime. So I do not have a certificate that the types are good. So when I use a value like that as a prefix of a type, bad things can arise. So the answer in the language is to we need to drastically restrict the types we can write in a lazy valve. Basically, only concrete types 
with known good bounds are allowed. So no intersections, no things, that, no abstract types that can be refined further. Okay, um, what about uh, type uh, projection? That's another thing in Scala that originally got introduced to essentially model inner classes in Java. And for some obscure reason, I'm actually not exactly sure, it got extended and then a lot of people did a lot of very cool type level stuff. So you, that was essentially the, the trick to make uh, the, the, the language Turing complete because using type projections, you can encode SK combinators. Well, same answer. Uh, that's not a value, that's a type which could be anything. So if it is, let's say, an intersection of two abstract type variables, through refinements later on, it could be anything. It could have bad bounds. So we need, again, to restrict the drastically the types we can write in a projection. Only concrete types with good bounds are allowed. And these two things, they are actually now in the new uh, Dotty compiler. So the first one was issue 50, so that's closed. And the second one was issue 1050. That's closed as, as well. But there's still things that remain to be done. Uh, one is null. So uh, you can just write bad bounds equals null and then use x as a prefix of a selection. Uh, again, null doesn't tell you anything whether the bounds are good or bad. So that means that we probably finally need to track null in the type system, which is straightforward, uh, but hasn't been done so far because uh, Scala programmers generally don't use null, so they think they can like one, one, one does not necessarily need a type system to track it. I proposed it at some point to essentially track null in the type system and the user community was uh, mostly negative to say, well, we have option. Uh, nobody uses null anyway, so why, why do you want to put it in a type system? But there's another thing, and that is actually matters again more in actual practice, and that's uh, in something can be null by virtue of simply being not yet initialized, right? There's a default value that we sort of inherited from Java that things get default values before uh, uh, when an object is created and then the initialization will go through the object and that means a value might be null by virtue of not being initialized. That means we also, to exclude that, we would also need to track initialization status, which is very hard, but it's indeed a, a, a source of a lot of problems and errors in typical Scala programs. So it would be worthwhile to do that uh, if we would know exactly what to do. So that's sort of, if uh, people want to invest time in a great system to be as about as flexible as what we can do now, but track initialization status, that would be great. Okay, so that brings me to the last part of the talk, to the actual compiler, Dottie. So Dottie is a working name for our new Scala compiler. It builds on dot and its internal data structures. Uh, like dot, it expresses generics as type members. So it really tries to model that fairly closely. And it also supports the next iterations of the Scala programming language. So the uh, architecture of Dottie is uh, fairly uh, typical for a compiler. So it essentially there's a front end, a parser, a type checker. It builds on abstract syntax trees. And there's a whole bunch of transformations uh, that um, simplify the AST to a form where it's essentially a, JD, uh, a Java virtual machine uh, code. Uh, so essentially a, a, a simplified Java that maps directly into JVM code. And then there's a code generator. Uh, one thing that's new in this compiler is that we uh, have uh, not only the, the interfaces, but we serialize the complete typed abstract syntax tree in, uh, as, as, a, as an artifact in the top level class file, which is very nice for introspections and lots of analyses. Um, so what the compiler supports then is uh, a new language, a language that essentially evolves uh, Scala to some degree and just want to give you a quick whirlwind tour through what, what will change in the language. So we tried first to um, reduce the features because we're going to add quite a few. So uh, in order to keep the thing in check, we should also reduce quite a few. So that's what we've done. So here are things that will now no longer be supported. Uh, procedure syntax. So uh, it was this thing to sort of... Uh, appeal to Java programmers to say, well, uh, you should, you can write a function that returns unit just like you would in Java. But the point is we should be 
programming predominantly in a functional way, so there shouldn't be that many functions that return unit. And then it just becomes an annoying special case that for these functions, you have a different syntax from all the other ones. So that's gone. Um, delayed in it, if you don't know it, you probably don't need to know what that is. <laughs> uh, macros. Uh, have been experimental so far, and were based on essentially Java reflection, uh, which is um, a problem if you have different platforms, such as um, JavaScript now and maybe native in the future. Uh, it's not that you can't do it because it's all compile time anyway, but it's, it just means that the concepts of Java reflection are too cumbersome. They're too complicated. You, you want to base it on something simpler. Uh, early initializers, that was a syntax which uh, let us uh, essentially solve the initialization problem to some degree by being able to say that certain things are initialized before the object is even created, but uh, we, have, we have a workaround with trait parameters now. Existential types, so that's actually a big one because you see in the calculus that we had here, we have dependent types, but we do not have existential types. And, uh, the, uh, that's, uh, in fact, it turns out that there's a large overlap of what you can achieve with existential types and dependent types, so having both turns out to be rather confusing. So when do you use which, as a language designer or as a programmer? So existential types are typically used uh, in Java and also in Scala to support wildcards, which are uh, at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, uh, in, in Java, they would be written with a question mark. Scala uses the underscore here. Uh, the wildcards can be and are, in fact, supported alternatively through the dependent types. So we give you essentially ex existential types as long as they can map to wildcards and therefore dependent types. Uh, the rest uh, will go. General type projection, have, we've already argued that's unsound, so it has to go. And that's it. So I should say that this looks rather radical. Uh, what we are currently investing in quite heavily is a, a rewrite tool, a smart rewrite tool that will try to essentially move an old Scala code base to this new world where essentially uh, the certain things can't, can't be done anymore. Uh, this is, to some, in, in some parts, it's very easy, for instance, for procedure syntax. In other parts, it's impossible. Like, if you want to still do SK combinators in the new Scala, then uh, you'll, you will be out of luck, because that, that just won't work, not with projections anyway. OK. New features. <coughs> so we've seen intersection types. Uh, so uh, it replaces T with U, but it's commutative. That's good. Uh, there's the dual of that, that's union types, so there will be a, a T or U, uh, and uh, that has a, a, a quite a pragmatic uh, advantage here, not just the added expressiveness, but in uh, the type system, because we have subtyping, we often need to do least upper bounds. Let's say you have an if then else, uh, so the then part and the else part, you have two types, and then the type of the this is the upper bound of those two. The problem is that in the absence of union types, these upper bounds can, be, can get very, very large. In fact, they can get infinitely large, so they, they are currently truncated at some point. But even with the most careful techniques for truncation, they still can get very, very large. So there are counterexamples where a type error message literally spans many, many pages of code. Uh, so with, T, with, with union types, you don't have that anymore. It's just essentially... Uh, the union of those two things, and you don't have an exploding least upper bounds. Uh, functionality adaptation. So that's that's another one, which is one of these little stumbling blocks. Uh, so uh, in, in Scala, we have pairs, and we have anary functions. Uh, and often, one confuses the two. So let's say you have a list of pairs, and you want to map a function. So the natural thing to write is, uh, well, give me the pair, x, y, and uh, uh, I give you, let's say, the sum of the two elements of the pair. Uh, what you have to do today still is actually to do a, a decomposition with a case here, uh, which, uh, because that thing is a syntax for a, func for a binary function that takes two parameters. It's not a function that takes a pair. So you have to de 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 decompose with the case. Uh, that's sort of confusing for, for newcomers, and it's something that the compiler can do very well because the compiler will see whether this is a list of pairs or a list of something else, so it can just replace one with the other. Trait parameters, 
So traits can now have parameters which are uh, initialized before the trait is initialized and that will replace the early definitions. Static methods in fields, that's mostly for better interop. Uh, Non-blocking lazy vowels, um, that's uh, the <coughs> currently uh, the, that, that the, we have these lazy values and the issue is that if you have a system with multiple threads, then the value has to be safely published to all the threads and that requires essentially some amount of synchronization, which is not very efficient. Uh, what we are going to do now is essentially turn it around and say that if you just define a lazy value, it's not thread safe. So it is single threaded by default, so it can be very efficient. And if, it, if you want it to be thread safe, then you have to prefix it with volatile, like the other things that you want to safely, safely pub publish. Okay. And uh, finally, we have type safe equality. That uh, was another big hole, which actually... Uh, turned out to be a much, much bigger problem than initially thought. We essentially, Scala took the operators from Java, and that includes equality. But actually having a thing where you can compare everything with everything turned out to be a huge problem in uh, uh, essentially not detecting type errors at compile time. So I would say that's actually the single biggest hole where that programmers actually experience that they say, well, I write, let's say I have a refactoring, I write this type to, uh, one type to another, then, then usually I expect my type system to say, well, I will tell you all the points that you have to adapt when you refactor a type to another. With universal equality, that's not true. You can have an object of this type, which now becomes another type. Universal equality just says, well, you can compare, but from now on, I will always tell you false, which is very, very helpful uh, for, for the compiler. So that, I think that, that's actually very big to be able to safely refactor code in large code bases. Okay, so these are sort of the things that are essentially implemented now uh, in, the, in the current version of Dottie. What uh, do we want to do in the future? Uh, we want to revamp the uh, um, macro system, uh, which is now called Scala Meta. Uh, and the idea is that it will split inlining from uh, meta programming. So essentially, there will be a much simpler thing called inline, which will just essentially enforce inlining of function definitions. So partial evaluation, so to speak, but programmer defined. And then meta would, will be for meta programming. So that's when you introspect, let's say you have an argument to a function and you will actually look up, well, what kind of syntax tree is it? And can I make, make uh, decisions on that? So meta will be essentially an, an add-on to the compiler, whereas inline will be standard. Uh, the second one is... Uh, Implicit function types, and that's sort of the most innocuous, smallish one, but for me it's actually the biggest change. Uh, so what you can write um, in Scala, you have these implicits, which essentially are, they can be used as type classes, they can be used as capabilities, they can be used as context. They are very, very versatile and powerful feature. But so far we couldn't abstract over them uh, because uh, implicits were... Uh, parameter section of a method, and you had to rewrite every time you wanted to write it, you had to write the same implicit parameters everywhere. So with implicit function types, we can abstract over them. So we can, for instance, have a contextual S, which is a function type from context to S, but we say the context is implicit. And that's in the type now, not in a, in a term like in a method definition or closure. So what that means is that we can have a definition of a function and its return type is, let's say, a contextual S. <laughs> and that will mean that, indeed, there is an implicit context that is injected into the function when I run it. So I will be able to just refer to that and say uh, the way to do that in Scala is to say implicitly and the type, and that will give you, give you the witness of the type. And uh, at the call side, you will be able to just write f of e as if f actually had an implicit parameter section here. So this looks small, but it's huge because for the first time it allows us abstraction over implicit parameters. And I've argued implicit parameters are really important, so abstracting over them is even more important. Okay, one thing that we can do uh, as a next step is using if implicit capabilities for effects, uh, which means that essentially where effects nowadays are expressed mostly monadic. Uh, I have a monad to express an effect. Here the approach is to make effects co-monadic, to say effects are essentially given by capabilities that you have in the environment. Instead of saying I have a, let's say, a state monad, I mutate state, 
I essentially have a function that has, gets the capability, you're allowed to mutate state, and then the type of the function can just be the normal function, and you don't need to put that in a monadic bind or things like that. So I actually think that co-monadic abstraction, abstractions are a much more natural fit to ex effect systems than monadic ex abstractions. Um, nullable types, um, I've already mentioned the, the necessity to do so. Fortunately, now with union types, we also have the means to do so because we can essentially just say a normal type won't have null with it. If you want null, then, well, it's a union. Uh, it's T or the type capital null, which is, has as its only value, the null value. And maybe there's, a, there's an abbreviation for that. Okay, and the last thing that we are... Uh, started to do is uh, look more at generic programming. In particular, in Scala, there's one part of the Scala community that uses a lot of generic programming constructs, all based around the thing called age lists, so essentially heterogeneous lists. And uh, I believe it's time and it makes sense to just put age lists in the standard compiler, in the standard language. Under probably, uh, the, the syntax will just be the standard tuple syntax. So you, you have a triple here. And then essentially you say, well, the triple is just a shorthand for essentially a right-leaning age list with the three elements S, T, U, right uh, terminated by unit. And you would have the types like the top usual tuple types, but they wouldn't be limited to, to 22 anymore. And furthermore, you can decompose them. You can have generic operations over them. OK, uh, that brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, for details I, uh, of the theoretical part, uh, that has appeared in uh, the Wadler Fest, uh, uh, Fest shift. Uh, the paper is called Essence of Dependent Object Types. Uh, there are many contributors to this. This is uh, far, far from being my own work predominantly. I helped a little bit, but there are many, many others. Uh, so uh, the theory, I should say, has several variants. I presented you the one we had in Wadlerfest, uh, uh, which has a small step evaluation semantics. There are also uh, a paper about big step evaluation. Uh, the variant I showed you was administrative normal form. There are other variants that use a store. Uh, you can have nominal subtyping for recursive types or structural subtyping. Another variant is presented this afternoon by Pia Kenada. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a paper, and other contributors to this effort include Sandro Stucki and Samuel Grütter. The implementation of the Dotty compiler, the new, the new Scala compiler, also has lots of contributors, including uh, Dimitri Petrashko, Guillaume Matres, uh, Liu Feng Yun, who are all at this conference, Nicolas Stucki also, Sebastian Duran, mm -hmm. Andre Lotak, and people who are not at this conference, as are Felix Mulder and Vera mm -hmm. Salvisberg. Thank you, and happy to answer questions. If you do the, uh, yes, that essentially that's 1ML. So 1ML has uh, a module system which has type members. I mean, modules have type members. And it encodes it all in uh, system F, uh, which has parametric polymorphism but not type members. Uh, I believe that the, so the encoding of modules and type members into, into, one, into system F, the elaboration, is, uh, I believe, more complicated than what I've shown you. So it's, it's, it's harder in the sense that I need more context to do that. But it's definitely possible. So you, you find it uh, better to have a common addict rather than a monadic 
do some kind of modeling effect so I'm more worried about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so the the um, so cohomonadic basically means that you have things in the environment and you can model, essentially you can do interesting operations with your environment. 